This is John, a teenager obsessed with tech and computers. But John is no ordinary teen. Just a few months earlier, he hacked into AT&T servers, his school district, and anything he could get his hands on. To him, finessing the system is like a hobby. But this time, he found himself inside the Department of Defense server, with logs for military personnel, and even software used to control the International Space Station. By changing one value, he could raise the temperature, cut the oxygen, or disable humidity controls. That's right, this kid hacked NASA from his bedroom and seized so much classified data that, if it fell into the wrong hands, it could be beyond catastrophic. So, how did he do it? In the suburbs of Pinecrest, Florida, lived the James family, a couple with one child named Jonathan James. From a young age, John was quite intelligent, super curious, and obsessed with tech and computers, in part because of his father, Robert, who worked as a programmer. Starting around age six, young John began spending long hours playing video games. It was the first of many things that would cause tension between him and his father. To curb his screen time, Robert installed several parental control programs. But for Jonathan, bypassing them became a game in itself. He had curiosity, persistence, and all the time in the world. Being able to bypass that software is what pushed James more towards understanding the system. He wanted to know how these electronics operate the code behind it. This, coupled with his introverted nature, led him to develop a sort of obsession with computers. But this was the late 90s. The internet was not widely available, and not many were sharing tutorials and lessons like it is today. Acquiring information about computers involved digging through forum posts, books, and sitting behind the screen for hours every single day. In an interview, John later said, I was just looking around, playing around. I was basically a kid with too much time on his hands. Starting around age 13, using the alias Comrade, Jonathan began exploring networks and bypassing basic security measures. His motivation wasn't financial. He wasn't interested in stealing credit cards. Instead, he was driven by curiosity and a desire to challenge himself. As he put it, I knew Unix and C like the back of my hand. Because I studied all these books and I was on the computer for so long. But the hard part isn't getting in. It's learning to know what it is that you're doing. As Jonathan gained confidence and skill, he shifted from low-risk targets to more serious systems. At first, his personal network, his home PC, or the local library was enough, but now he wants to explore bigger targets. Around 1999, at the age of 15, John carried out a series of hacks into several high-profile systems. He started by targeting Bell South's telecommunications infrastructure, then moved on to breach his own school district's computer network. With each successful attempt, his confidence grew, and so did the scale of his targets. But John's undoing came when he infiltrated a server belonging to the Defense Threat Reduction Agency, a division of the Department of Defense responsible for monitoring nuclear, biological, and chemical threats. He installed a back door and a packet sniffer, which allowed him to intercept over 3,000 emails, usernames, and passwords, including those of military personnel. But this was just the prelude of what's about to come. He kept searching for anything interesting in the credentials he acquired from the DTRA, and one caught his attention. It gave him access to NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. Once inside NASA's network, 
James downloaded 13 proprietary software packages, valued at $1.7 million. But what makes this breach even more critical is the fact that it includes source code used to regulate temperature, humidity, and oxygen levels aboard the International Space Station. At only 15 years of age, from his house, John managed to finesse one of the biggest agencies in the world. Not only that, the gravity of his action here is far beyond his head, but at that time, he was none the wiser. His action here put a big target on his back, and it's what led the feds to start a manhunt for him. And while he tried to remain hidden, the large volume of files he was downloading caused NASA's network to slow down. This unusual traffic caught their attention and raised red flags. The software being stolen was too valuable, and their importance is too crucial. The software that could cause harm to astronauts if meddled with. This elevated the incident to a national security concern. Therefore, NASA was forced to shut down its systems immediately to prevent him from further copying any more files. In the meantime, they quickly ran forensic scans to try and find ways of tracking down the perpetrator behind the breach. Since this was a national security incident, NASA cybersecurity experts worked with federal law enforcement to track the intrusion. After a detailed forensic scan of their system logs, they discovered the installed back door. By tracing repeated connections, they identified a specific IP address responsible for the access. That address was linked to a home in South Florida, the James family residence. On January 26, 2000, federal agents executed a search warrant at the James family home. They seized Jonathan's computers, hard drives, and floppy disks, and took him in for questioning. A forensic analysis of the devices revealed source code from NASA's International Space Station software, evidence of unauthorized access to Department of Defense systems, and various hacking tools and log files that documented his activities. They realized the threat they were looking for was merely a teenager who managed to compromise their network and breach their data. After an intensive interrogation with John, he revealed his intentions behind all of this. He stated he picks targets that seem like a challenge for his skills. The thrill of intruding on a secure network quenches his thirst, but opens his appetite to find a bigger target. He even left a comment that the code is not well done, not worth its high value, and that he was downloading the source code to learn and study C programming using something made by the government. In September of 2000, after being trialed as a juvenile, John became the first minor in US history to be convicted of hacking into federal systems. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to six months of probation. But not long after, he tested positive for drugs, so his probation became six months in a juvenile detention facility. Attorney General Janet Reno at the time said, This case, which marks the first time a juvenile hacker will serve time in a detention facility, shows that we take computer intrusion seriously. The scale of this breach and the agencies involved turned this case into global news. Headlines ran for weeks, and the attention wasn't something John or his family could escape. He was also banned from using computers for anything other than school or work. But even with the sentence behind him, the government didn't look away. They still saw him as a serious threat. If he had been trialed as an adult, a breach of this scale could have easily landed him up to 10 years in prison. Post-sentence, he tried to rebuild his life and avoid public attention as much as he could, keeping a clean profile. In interviews, John expressed regret, stating that he had learned his lesson and warned others about the consequences of hacking, but also pointed out how everyone is vulnerable in this age of technology. After a few years, 
John ended up working in IT and computer security companies. However, he struggled with depression and paranoia, especially over the belief that he was still under government surveillance. Things got worse in late 2007, when the U.S. Secret Service suspected him of being involved in the massive TJX retail data breach, which resulted in the theft of millions of credit card numbers. Although he denied any involvement, his home was raided again. No charges were filed due to a lack of evidence, but the incident put even more pressure on John. He believed he was being set up to be a scapegoat for a crime he did not commit. A year later, in 2008, Jonathan James's name made one final appearance in the headlines, this time under tragic circumstances. On May 18, 2008, Jonathan took his own life at the age of 24, leaving behind a note in which he stated that he had nothing to do with the TJX breach and that he no longer had faith in the justice system. In his side note, he wrote, I have no faith in the justice system. Perhaps my actions today and this letter will send a stronger message to the public. I have lost control over this situation, and this is my only way to regain control. Jonathan James was not a hacker who chased financial gains, but rather, he hacked to prove to himself that he could. In doing so, he exposed the weakness that would forever change how the U.S. approached cybersecurity, especially concerning large and important networks like that of NASA. Although his life ended in tragedy, his story still echoes through the corridors of cyber defense today, and the fact that he was only 15 years old when he did it serves as a reminder that no one is safe.